Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad you are here. Um, this is uh, our sporadic adult forum hour, so, um, but we knew that we had a guest preacher today, the Reverend Ian Markham, very Reverend uh, Ian Markham, who is the Dean and President of Virginia Theological Seminary, uh, where I attended seminary. And so I asked him to also teach during this time so you could have a little bit more experience with him and his great wisdom. Uh, so today's uh, topic is the sin of worry. Uh, I've talked to several people who are like, oh, I probably do need to go to that. So um, so I'm looking forward to this time together. Uh, we'll let him talk and then do a little uh, question and answer so that you can ask any questions you may have. Uh, we do have folks on Zoom, and so I'll kind of monitor the chat. So if there are questions, I'll just let you know about those. Uh, but otherwise, uh, please enjoy Ian Markham. And if you don't need that, you can do whatever you want. No, thank you very much. Uh, and it's lovely to be with you all. And it's such a beautiful part of the state. So thank you very much for the journey and watching the sun come up this morning. It was wonderful. I'm grateful for that gift. Um, so uh, yes, it's lovely to be with you all. Um, I, I, I wrote a book once called um, Lectionary Levity, which is one joke for every gospel in the lecture, every <laughs> gospel and lectionary. Uh, and I did so because I'm a great believer that Jesus used humor really effectively. And the sort of humor Jesus liked actually are things like, you know, when he says, in the Sermon on the Mount, judge not lest you be judged. And then says, you know, it's a bit like walking up to somebody and saying, oh, excuse me, you've got a little speck of wood in your eye when there's a whacking great big plank of wood in your own. That was a Jesus joke. You know, they stood around slapping their knees saying, Jesus, you're so funny. And that's the reason why he had a reputation as somebody who was great company at a, at, at a party. You know, I mean, um, that's, you know that because of they draw a contrast between John the Baptist, who wasn't, and Jesus, who clearly was. So it's very, so I, I often start all my talks with a joke. And when you think of Jesus's humor, they're visually, they're mainly visual jokes. So speck of wood, plank in your own eye jokes, you know. So I think the nearest contemporary uh, form we have are, are elephant jokes. You know, how do you know when there's an elephant in the refrigerator? Well, that's easy. Footprints in the butter. <laughs> So, so of course, immediately, you know, the only clue there's an elephant, massive, big, grey animal with footprints in the butter. So it's just like the plank. And so, how do you know when there are two elephants in the refrigerator? Two sets of footprints in the butter. How do you know when there are three elephants in the refrigerator? And at this point, you think there's a pattern, and you're about to say three. No, you can't close the door <laughs> because, of course, they're big. You know, and by the time you get three in your refrigerator, it's just just full. Uh, how do you get four elephants into a compact car? Well, that's easy, two in the back, two in the front. How do you know when four elephants have been trying to get into your refrigerator? Compact car parked outside. I know. I know. I can see I can see the letters to the rector now. Dear, dear rector, can I just say how appalled I was by those jokes? They haunted me for the rest of my life. People say to me, how do you remember a joke? Uh, it's very easy to remember jokes, actually. Um, all you have to do is tell somebody within 12 hours of hearing it. So if you want to inflect those jokes on each other, you will then remember them forever. And... Uh, and all your grandchildren will be appalled or whatever. Okay, our Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow, or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not 
much more clothe you, O you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day is enough trouble of its own. Okay, so that's the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus telling us about the sin of worry. Now, the interesting thing about sins, in my experience, in fact, speaking personally, in my experience, <laughs> you know, one thing I don't really think is a sin is worry. Right? I do it pretty well. I'm pretty skilled at worrying. You know, I worry about, I've got a 26-year-old son. You know, I worry he's living in Boston. I worry about him when he's taking a journey. Or my wife just come back from England. Yes, it is an English accent you're hearing. Um, and, and don't worry, there are plenty of people here who can translate. Uh, <laughs> when I say strange things, um, I still say strange things. It's interesting. You know, you suddenly go... Of course, um, Americans don't talk about lorries. You know, in England, you drive a lorry, not a truck. You know, when I arrived in America, I told my five-year-old son, um, I'm now an American citizen, just to reassure you all. And, and America has given me more joy than you can possibly imagine. So I'm hugely grateful. I love this place. I love all the bits of America that Americans disapprove of. I love McDonald's fries. <laughs> I think Disney's just fabulous, you know. I love all that stuff. Anyway, um, so I was telling my son, look, for heaven's sake, walk on the pavement. Because in England, of course, the pavement is the sidewalk. And all his friends started walking on the road. And they said, we're walking on the pavement. I'm, ah. <laughs> OK, right. So uh, I think most people don't think sins are really a worry is a sin. But Jesus is pretty strict about it. And the reasons Jesus gives are really interesting. Uh, so he starts by saying that when you worry, you're doing a couple of things, right, which are, which are, 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 are bad. I mean, you know, he's, he's pretty, the language is pretty severe, actually, uh, for something we all do. He says, first of all, there really is a God. Now, this comes as a shock to Episcopalians to learn that, you know, we are supposed to believe there really is a God, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> This is core, this is foundational. And, and Jesus is basically saying, look, have some confidence that God is really there. In other words, your traveling companion on living in life is the creator of everything that is. I mean, that's pretty cool. You know, you know how people love to be connected. You know, you'd like to have connections with, I don't know, the mayor or with the uh, CEOs or, you know, uh, with, with the networks or, or with political leadership, we all like those connections. Each of us is invited into a relationship to be connected with the creator of everything that is, who knows us more intimately, worries about sparrows flowing to the ground, and therefore worries more about you. Worries about the number of hairs, incidentally, the good Lord's number on my hair. <laughs> I'm suffering from hair loss. You know, it's happened overnight. You know, I woke up one morning and realized I had no hair. Okay, uh, but, you know, uh, that, 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 that God knows us that intimately and God is really there. So the first thing Jesus is saying to all of us is when we worry, what we in a weird sort of way show is our lack of faith in God, our lack of confidence that God's really there. So it's a real challenge. It's almost like Jesus is saying, when you worry, what you're actually doing is you're saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Lord. I'm not sure you're really there. I'm not sure you'll, you've, you've got my back. I'm not sure that I'll find a way through. The second thing Jesus says is, you know, worry, of course, is pretty futile. You know, there's an exercise people are supposed to do when they become habitual worriers. You're supposed to write down your anxiety and stick it in a worry jar. I don't know if people have tried this. So you write down, you know, I'm worried that I might lose my job at the end of the month, right? You stick it in the worry jar. And then at the end of the month, you pull all the worries out and you look at them. And what actually, thank God, happens most of the time <laughs> is the worries don't materialize. So what you do is you put lots of energy into worrying about a hypothetical that doesn't happen. And the thing is, worry is corrosive of the moment you're in. So you don't spend your time 
holding the hand of the person you love. You don't spend your time appreciating the beauty of the tree. You don't spend your time, uh, you know, stroking the cat. I mean, you don't, instead, what you're doing is you're consuming all this energy into something that's utterly point futile. It doesn't actually solve any problem. In fact, it exacerbates problems because it creates an underlying anxiety that means you don't enjoy the moment you're in. You know, worry never sorts anything out. It's just useless. You know, you worry about a test. And of course, the interesting thing is, so, okay, I'm going to have a test. So I'm worried about the test result, right? You stick it in the worry jar. Now, the interesting thing is, the test result will be what the test result is, you know? And all the worrying you do waiting for the test result just means that, you know, in my case, when I worry, I get a little irritable with my darling wife. You know, a little short. You know, I, um, I, uh, I probably uh, eat and drink more than I should. You know, so there are things you do that actually is damaging because you're worrying about a scenario, which and that all that anxiety only damages the moment you're in and makes not an iota of difference to the result. So okay, so you get the result bad and the results bad news. Worrying didn't help or make an iota of difference to that, says Jesus. So stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. And then there's a, something very interesting. Right towards the end of that passage, Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So that's the third place Jesus goes. Now, kingdom of God, right? The reign of God, living in a society where the values of God are central and where we live them in such a way that uh, we recognize the centrality of those values. Now, the reign of God is something that is both arrived in Jesus and yet still arriving, okay? This, this could get very technical, but I'm gonna be very gentle with you this morning. I've been up since 4.30, so <laughs> <laughs> I need to be. Okay, right, so, so the idea is that we are part of the anticipation of the reign of God. We're both living under, we are living aware that God is. We're seeking to live as God intends. And we're in a community that seeks to honor God. Okay? That means part of what Jesus means when seek ye first kingdom of God, seek the community of persons who are living life as God intends and in so doing are there for you. So the question is, so people say things like, well, you're not supposed to worry about your food and you're not supposed to worry about your clothes, okay? But I mean, we need food and we need clothes, Lord. You know, so how's that? Okay, I'm not supposed to worry about them, but I do need them, you know? How are you gonna square this little circle? Do you square circles? I never really understood that. Okay, right, so how are you gonna sort this out? And of course, part of the answer is, we're the anticipation of the kingdom. So when somebody does fall sick, you know, the, the, the person who puts together the meal list and delivers meals, that is kingdom work. You know, the, what you want to do for each other is you want to be able to say, look, I know that you're going through a difficult time and I want to be the person who helps you get through this season. So you've got three, you can see what Jesus is doing. First of all, I know it comes as a shock to Episcopalians, but God really exists. God really cares. This is all true. You know, we're not making it up, right? Believe it, trust it. Live as if that's the reality. Then secondly, you know, worrying is a futile act and destructive act. Because all you do is you put so much anxiety, you make the present. You know, every moment of every day is an extraordinary gift. I was um, driving with my, I've got to keep my arm time, I'm all right. I was driving with my, um, it's a complicated relationship with this. We had friends in, in West Hartford where we moved to who were German and they went back to Germany. I don't know. And we stayed in touch. But because their daughter was born in the United States, she was an American citizen. So... She decided to come and spend a year living with us so she'd go to a high school in Alexandria, Virginia. And it was great. She was lovely. Her name was Sophia. 
Um, she was bubbly and interesting and thoughtful and 16. And so I learned something of 16 year old. They're different from boys, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> I don't want to be controversial. Okay, so I know I know I need to stop right now. Um, I've got a son. The thing about sons is they just don't talk to you. They just run. That's actually easier than anyway. Uh, so anyway, I was out Christmas shopping with Sophia. And, uh, you know, because I was trying to buy something for Lacey and my wife. And I thought she'd be helpful, and she was. And uh, I was, and suddenly she said to me, "How many days are there in a typical life?" That's a great question. So the answer, if you bless with eighty years, uh, is about twenty-nine thousand two hundred days. And I remember hearing that, going, "That's not very many." <laughs> you know, that's like. And then she suddenly said, let's see how many days you've used up. And I thought, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time I was 50, whatever, five, 56. And so I'm 60 now. I'm very conscious of my age, just a minute. You know, I think 60 was like, oh, Lord, I've got to start behaving like an old man, right? So I've, um, I'm doing well, my son tells me. So, um, so, uh, so we did the, you know, you got your phone. So we did the sums, 19,900 days I used up. I've only got 10,000 left. I was thinking, Lordy, that's like nothing. <laughs> and, um, and then she actually, I said, well, how many days have you used up? And of course being 15, it was 5,600 or whatever. And then she was funny. She said, um, but that's not right. And I said, it is, we've just done the sums. And she said, no. First three years of those, you can't really count. I didn't know anything. So, you know, and that's true, of course. But what's interesting is you realize the fragility and gift of time. I mean, the single greatest <laughs> blessing we enjoy every single day is just rolling out of bed. And the first thing we all ought to say in the shower or as you peer out the window and look at the birds or whatever, is thank you, Lord, for the gift of this day. That should be just habitual. You know, you just want to say that every day. You want to plaque in your shower. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this day because it's the most extraordinary gift you're ever going to have. And then Jesus says to you, and don't, for heaven's sake, spend the day worrying. Just don't. Because what you do is you spurn the gift you've just been given. So focus on enjoying the fact that today you have this gift of living a life and you're not going to spend the day worrying about the state of the country, or worrying about your grandkids or worrying about, you're not going to do that. You're going to try and be a constructive presence in this day that lives out the values of the kingdom. And in doing that, of course, you will be an agent that brings God's help to somebody else. You know, um, one interesting thing is that uh, church is really important and um, and when you put all this together you can sort of see why why actually supporting the congregation matters it matters because you know I I get that so there is this little middle class illusion isn't there you know the, the, the weird thing about Okay, this is one of those dreadful moments in the talk where I'm, I've got about six thoughts I want to share with you simultaneously. Okay, that's the reason why I'm starting sentences and not finishing it. <laughs> so I'm going to slow myself right down. Let me start with thought number one. What sort of lives were the people who heard that originally and people who wrote that originally, you know, the authorship, Matthew, and those congregations, what sort of lives were they living? Well, they were living difficult lives. You know, it's worth remembering life expectancy, 42. Uh, very heavily influenced by socioeconomic status, but about 42. Um, there was actually quite a lot of population density in Roman towns. So the weird thing is, although there weren't very many people living, uh, you know, compared to now, 
uh, the population of the world was small, uh, what Roman, Roman towns tend to be very, very small, partly because they had to defend against potential invaders. So they wanted a, a Roman wall and they wanted, and therefore typically what you would get are high population density in a small piece, you know, per acre. And they, Roman buildings would have been sort of three floors. And although there were regulations, the Romans were savvy and learned pretty quickly that you want to build these things in certain ways to make sure they don't come down. The regulations weren't really enforced. So what would happen is the wealthier people would live on the ground floor because the falling down of buildings was a commonplace. And of course, you know, they didn't know about antibiotics and they didn't know about hygiene. So sewage removal was difficult. Uh, Roman baths, I mean, they were not good, really, because, of course, the water was largely stagnant. And so therefore, there were all sorts of microbes wreaking havoc with your system. They've done tests on, um, on fossil remains uh, that actually shows that 99% of people who died had some sort of stomach um, infection or illness that they were living with. So, so when you read these words, these are people who have every reason to worry. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're highly likely to die much sooner than we are. They're in perpetual discomfort or illness. They are in danger of living in property that tumbles over and kills them and their families. They are, and of course, pretty soon, you know, uh, for, for people who read Matthew's gospel, they were being persecuted by the Romans. You know, the authorities were trying to track them down and kill them. Every single witness to, our, to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the possible exception of John, uh, was was martyred and you know died for their witness um, and yet I also think it's funny Paul writes things like in Philippians to the church in Philippi which was a typical community typical Roman community rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice and then he actually in that passage actually says be not anxious about things for tomorrow but in everything be grateful be be full of thanksgiving and you sort of want to sit and say uh, Paul, do you have any idea what I'm coping with? <laughs> you know, I'm feeling sick all the time. You know, I've got all this worry. Church has been persecuted. And yet you're telling me to rejoice in the Lord always. Trust in God. But of course, see, this is the, this drives atheists crazy. Atheists hate it when Christians say, you know, I was in a car accident and I was pretty unwell, but I'm pleased and I thank God for the fact that my kid got out okay and, and I'm all right. I've only broken three bones. And atheists at that point fall around laughing and say, well, that's really stupid thanking God. Why didn't God just prevent the accident before you? And then, you, then that'd be much better, wouldn't it? But of course they miss the point. The point is accidents happen, sickness happens, all these things happen. But the point is also that we find grace in those things. And the point is also, okay, so where's the value in being resentful? Where's the value in being mad about it? Where's the value in just, I mean, if I've got a choice of either finding ways of being grateful about the problems I'm facing or being bitter and enraged, which one's healthier actually? Which one's better for your head? Which one's more constructive? So Jesus is saying, first of all, believe God's really there. Second of all, actually recognize that responding, aware of the reality of God, trusting God and finding the edges that are often full of grace and hopefulness in every situation, is healthier than fretting and worrying because worry is one of those negative experiences that does not make one iota of difference to the predicament you're in. And then finally, 
the community of faith of which you're a part anticipates the kingdom and is there for each other. And I know you're in the middle of the stewardship campaign, so let me just do a not too subtle plug. <laughs> but as you think a little bit about your own faith, do I really trust in God? Because of course, the re what stops us being generous is we sit there going, wow, I need that money. This might happen or that might happen. So what happens is we go through a realm of hypotheticals and God is just saying, look, I really am there for you. Trust it. And we need the community to be there for you if something happens. So support it. And that's that's the argument of, of that's that's the Jesus argument for why this moment is a is a good moment to reflect on who we are and how we can create the community that really enables the church to be there for others. So in conclusion, you know, when we sit down and worry about sins, Christians are peculiar, really. We tend to focus on sins like, um, well, we worry an awful lot about sexual sin and we worry about, you know, uh, big sins like stabbing people and murder and, you know, um, you know, these sort of big, massive sins. We worry about those. But actually, one of the commandments of scripture is don't worry. It's something that no preacher preaches on because, you know, we're hypocrites enough. So, you know, it's so obviously difficult to preach on this. So we tend to stay away from it. Uh, but I do think it's worth remembering this is a commandment of Jesus. This is something we really should work on. And we should be less gentle with ourselves when we worry. We ought to just sit and say, okay, I'm not going to be so gentle. I'm going to acknowledge that I really do think God's there. I really do think that God's got my back. I really do think that the worry is disruptive. I really do think I need to live every single second of every single day, aware of how fragile life is aware of how extraordinary the gift is, aware that tomorrow could all be different. And therefore, I'm not going to corrode the moment I'm living in by worrying endlessly about hypotheticals. Instead, I'm going to grab the hand of people I love and just tell them I love them. I'm going to put on Mozart's solemn vespers, the fourth one. I mean, it's just sublime. I'm just going to find ways actually to really appreciate the moment and the gift of the moment that God's given me. And then finally, I'm going to love this church that I'm part of. And we're going to make sure that this church is a church that's there for each other when problems do arise, because arise they will. See, that's not the promise of the text. The promise of the text isn't there won't be any prom problems. The promise of the text is God is there for you and that worry is corrosive. And you need to be part of a community that's anticipating the kingdom. Uh, that, I've finished, basically. I'm happy to take questions. I'm allowed some questions? Yeah. I've got some questions. Any questions? Feel free not to have questions. I never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and feel free to ask about other things, like, I don't know, I support Liverpool soccer team. That's the only thing that I love American get football sports. I love them. Um... Probably, my league table would probably go, I think American football's a great game, although I do worry about what it's doing to each other's heads. Um, I mean, you know, it's a fabulous game, though. I mean, it really is like a battle, isn't it, really? I think basketball, when the games are close, is sort of really riveting. Anyway, so I can talk about sport. I support Liverpool soccer team, if you're interested. As run by an evangelical. Unfortunately, the good law's not looking out for Liverpool this season. <laughs> okay, right. Any questions about anything? Yes, please. What is community So, uh, what is the community of the church supposed to be like? Yeah. So, I think, so when you think about the community of the church, right, the, the interesting thing is that. 
I mean, this is a strong, vibrant church, okay? You know, and by that I mean the outreach ministries you're doing is, is amazing, and that's anticipating the kingdom. The quality of your liturgy and your services is amazing. The care of your campus is, is amazing. I mean, so that you are part of a strong, thriving congregation. But of course, you know, churches like anything really, like any organization, they're actually fragile. You know, the weird thing about meandering around um, Athens in Greece is you come to the Parthenon and you're suddenly reminded that a group of people once gathered and worshipped the sun god and did their bit to keep it going and presumably found resources to build a, what would have been in its day quite, quite amazing, a sort of Westminster Abbey plus, 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 you know, extraordinary. And now it's a ruin. And what changed? Well, people stopped gathering. People stopped making it a priority. People stopped attending. So institutions are precious. They depend on people saying, I'm there for it. I believe it. I want to support it. And, and a healthy community is a community where you know that you forge friendships. You know, loneliness is one gift of rural America is loneliness infects human lives less than urban America. But it is a major issue. And male friendships, incidentally, as you age, is a real issue. Having deep textured friendships is, is one of the, you know, it's, I, I say I'm doing it again. I've got 20 <laughs> thoughts and I'm trying to decide which one to go after. So one interesting thing about church, since 1996, that was the first big study. And uh, the study uh, was a longitudinal, um, massive study. And the question was, um, what are the health benefits of church? And this particular study actually uh, determined, one of the findings was that if you go to church uh, three times a week, now that's going some, I mean, yes, sir. I mean, I have to go more than once a week because, you know, I'm often at the front of one. Um, but that means you're, you're going on Sunday and you're also perhaps a member of the choir or doing an outreach ministry or joined a Bible study or something like that. Uh, so, uh, but if you do that, then you add up to seven years to your life, right? So if you're 25, it would be seven extra years. I keep telling my son he's 26. But this is the time to hit three times a week and he just stares at me. Okay, right. So now that's a very controversial finding in 96. Since then, something like, I don't know, 4,000 studies have been done. Huge number. It's, a, it's an area of increasing obsession by secular sociologists and social scientists because they sort of don't believe it. And, and yet all the studies say the same thing. And the interesting thing is, it's not so much what you believe, it's actually going, right? So you, I'm afraid you don't get the health benefits of church if you just play golf on Sunday, okay? It's weird. And people are puzzled why that is, right? People are puzzled why that is. Why is attendance so important? And the other interesting thing is it's better than Probus and Lions and, you know, so it doesn't, something, so something happens in church that's really good for you. And they did, in 2016, they did a massive study of nurses because people started saying, well, surely it's socioeconomic. What actually happens is if you are, you know, if you go to church, you're less likely to drink to excess, you're less likely to smoke, you're, you're more likely to have friends. Isn't that all that's going on? And so they did this study of nurses in, this is out of Harvard University, and that too showed a two-year differential when you exclude from all other factors attendance at church. It really is, it's up there. It's like eating your vegetables and going to the gym. You know, uh, you, you can go and get a Dunkin' Donuts after this because you've already done something good <laughs> for your bodies, okay? You know, you're, you are okay because, I mean, granted, it'll cancel out for your good effect of church, <laughs> but nevertheless, you can. Okay, so, so the interesting thing is church is like special. 
you know, it's, it really is literally life-giving. And a healthy church is where you can make, you have liturgy that feeds you, and you have friends that are there for you, and you have a range of activities that can make a difference when problems arise, and where that congregation's doing something to help those outside its walls to, to cope. Because coping with life is like really <coughs> important. And that's, that's what a healthy church is. Thank you for that question. Yes, please. Do you have any um, personal advice on habits of reminding yourself to be grateful in moments of strife? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I do, I do have a strict, strict, strict discipline in the shower. So I pick the shower because, you know, it's time, it's sort of fellow time. And I pick it because it reminds me of baptism. So I think afresh about the fact that I'm baptized and redeemed by, you know, baptized into the family of God. And I use that moment to just thank God for the gift of the new day. And I just, I'm strict about that. You know, it's just something I always do. I just never forget to do it. You know, and I pause and I, and I think of the things for which I am grateful for. You know, I'm grateful for my wife, Leslie. Um, I'm grateful for my son, Luke. I'm grateful for the vocation I have as a priest and my role in an institution. Now, you know, the ways in which I feel grateful does vary because when you're worried about laying somebody off or you're worried about the operating budget or you're worried about, you know, um, uh, my, um, so the, the American family, I'm, I'm part of a huge family in the UK, uh, I'm one of the six siblings. It goes, girl boy, girl boy, girl boy. My mother was very organized. I'm number four. I'm number four, incidentally. Can I just say, middle children in America. It's just true. So, so there are no photographs of me as a baby. Isn't that weird? There are tons of my, the oldest daughter, like albums. The oldest son, because first son, of course, albums. They get to number four. Oh, another kid. You know, we're just sort of like the forgotten. The, by the time they get to the baby, oh, it's the baby. But the middle kids, we, we carry a cross. <laughs> you know. Um, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so we've now upset three quarters of the... <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, uh, but, but, in the, but the American family is much smaller. Uh, my wife's family is very small and you know so there are so for example just recently my uh, my sister-in-law um, Elaine is married to Ian and his sister died and my wife's just come back from a funeral and therefore you, of course there are moments when you're grateful to, with a very heavy heart you know with with a deep sense of sadness and and there and then you're in that paradoxical place, and it is a paradox. It's a, it's the, and it's a paradox of faith. It's it's something that ostensibly is contradictory, and yet, where you simply just sit and you say, "Look, um, this is breaking my heart, Lord. I'm grateful for everything I have. I offer this situation to you." And then, of course, the thing to do. So so what you're supposed to do with anxiety? What do you do when you worry? You're supposed to pause, confront it, and then give it to God and let it go. Pause, confront, give it to God and let it go. Pause, confront, give it to God and let it go. That is what you're supposed to do. So I went to visit Linda just before she died. I happened to be in England. I mean, it was a, I mean, she had breast cancer eight years ago, came back. She was going to go to Italy, but she didn't. She collapsed and then was in hospital and died three weeks later. Just horrendous. And I visited just before she died. And, um, and I, you know, and the repercussions in my little small family are, are reverberating because, because she, she was much loved. And she was a remarkable, remarkable woman. 
61. Um, but the rule is, Lord, I give you the challenge of this life. I'm desperately worried for her and for those who love her. And now I'm going to leave that with you. You know, the, you know the, um, oh dear, St. Patrick breastplate song thing, mm -hmm. you know, Christ below me, behind me. I love the image of Christ being behind me. Mm -hmm. You know, I like the image of Christ being behind me and looking over my shoulder and saying, okay, you're facing all these problems, Ian. What are we going to make of them together? What are we going to, how are we going to sort this out? What do you think we should do? And I like that image. You know, it's not that the problem goes away or disappears in the case of Linda, she died. But, but there was grace in it. It was a good death in all sorts of ways. She was conscious to the end. She said goodbye to people she loved. She put her affairs in order in a significant way. <clears throat> Uh, she was reconciled to somebody. So there was a, there was a lot of grace there. And, and you just say, okay, I'm grateful for that. But that's the rule with worry. And I'll finish with this because I've got to finish in two minutes. You know, of course, worries arise. Because you're worried about your job, you're worried about your kids, you're worried about your teenager, you're worried about whatever. So the worries arrived, and it's not wrong ever to confront it. You should name it. You should go and find a quiet space in the yard, sit with the dog, and then just pause and say, okay, Lord, I'm worried sick about, and now I'm going to give it to you and leave it with you. And then you go back in and you say, okay, I'm now present for my spouse, for the challenges that I'm facing that day, for the people I'll meet. And I just give it. My presence is what I need to bring to this moment. You've been wonderful. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. to head off to worship. If you've already worshipped, you can head home, but you're welcome to come join us again, should you like.